Hi there, welcome to the first lecture uh, for RSC 5010, a bioregional approach to communities. My name is Laird Christensen and I'm joined here today by my colleague, Dr. Mark Daly, uh, who contributed to uh, the design of this course and who brings a very important social science dimension uh, to our study of our own communities. And so Mark, I wonder if we can begin by you talking just a little bit about uh, what there is in your own background that allows you to bring a different dimension sure. into this course. Well, I'd like to thank Larry Christensen for inviting me to be part of this course because he's uh, done most of the work in, in designing it in the past and, and so I'm, I'm grateful that I've had a chance to bring in some of my background into the course. Uh, I'm an anthropologist. I have a PhD in ecological slash environmental anthropology. Um, and so if you unpack that a little bit, there's a lot of things to do with humans in the environment. My training is looked from a cross-cultural perspective at humans, hunters and gatherers, farmers, Africa, Asia, all scales, prehistory and history, whether it's looking at energy, nutrient systems, that kind of formal scientific way, uh, all the way to things very political, um, modern and activist. So a very wide range of looking at humans in nature, um, as well as personal experience, you know, trying to learn the plants and raising goats at my house. Great. Well, one of the things that I wanted to emphasize in our uh, initial lecture here is the importance of learning how to imagine our way past the political boundaries that we're used to uh, letting define the places that we live. If it were a little warmer, a little less snowy right now, we would take you down to the river behind campus. Uh, we have a nice swimming hole down there. And um, it's not a very large river, but it serves as the border between the states of New York and Vermont. Um, but if you look at the plants on one side of the river and the plants on the other side of the river, you'll see that there really is no distinction, no natural distinction between those, those two sides of the river. Um, and that's a really good example of the artificiality of political boundaries, which is not to suggest that political boundaries don't shape the reality of what happens on, on one side or the other of them. We can look around the world and find uh, many, many examples of somewhat artificially defined boundaries between Two, two nations or two peoples that are in fact the, um, the impetus for, uh, for plenty of conflict. Uh, there are real effects of these boundaries, but bioregional perception begins with that process of suggesting that the way we're used to thinking about where we live is artificially constructed. And that if we're looking for solutions in terms of sustainability, resilience, the first thing we need to do is really come to a better understanding, a more fundamental understanding of the places where we live. And we do that by uh, basically imagining our way past those political boundaries and understanding uh, where we live in terms of a larger sort of ecological um, uh, definition. Um, it's probably worth mentioning here too that we're very invested here at Green Mountain College in making sure that uh, bioregional perception does not necessarily lead to a bioregionalist ideology. As you'll see in one of your readings for this week by Doug Aberley, uh, that's where it takes him from uh, learning to see where he lives in a bioregional sense, he ends up making an argument for a decentralized form of governance. Uh, if that's where it takes you, that's fine, but it doesn't have to take you there. Something as simple as the basic uh, step of understanding where you live in terms of, say, the Environmental Protection Agency's uh, eco-regions is an act of bioregional perception. And that's what we're aiming for here. How can understanding where we live in these ecological, geological, climatological terms help us imagine how societies may become more resilient and more sustainable? <clears throat> makes me think of a few particulars, and we were chatting about this just a little bit ago. Um, the, the task before us, if we wish to re-inhabit the places we live, um, thinking and seeing and living bioregionally, is, is a huge turnaround for the way that most of modern lives are constructed, or, you know, again, thinking of political boundaries, our, our highway structure, our infrastructure, um, the commutes to our jobs. It's, things are working against us. And so, without being intimidated by the really large-scale uh, problems and issues facing us, I like the idea of even at the onset of playing with a little bit. There's even value in um, imagining certain things. And I'm thinking of uh, 
Uh, it's always good to quote Gary Snyder. Gary Snyder once saying, first step, stay outside in a tent a few days. Become reacquainted with um, your climate, rainfall, uh, what the air feels like from morning to afternoon to evening, things we're, we're more buffered from. After that, we could go to learning the plants, you know, learning, setting a goal of learning 10 plants where you live that you didn't know before is rewarding, uh, not terribly hard to do, and, and re-inhabits you in a certain way. Um, another thing I've tried to do myself is to learn your watersheds. Once I put on, you know, rubber boots from Kmart and began walking um, the shoals and watersheds of where I lived in Georgia, and I found a piece of pottery and a little shoal next to raccoon tracks. It was 2,000 years old. You know, little discoveries waiting. Uh, and I mentioned to Laird that once I had a 40-mile commute while living in Georgia, and I gave myself the task. It was a mental challenge, you know, a task of imagination, to try to think of the watersheds as I drove over them so that on the crest of one hill I would realize that I'm leaving the, the Coney watershed and entering another watershed. Uh, and ultimately I failed, I couldn't keep up with it. It was too fast driving in a car. Um, but these types of mental exercises, these uh, baby steps of reacquaintance are just as important or part of the larger scale goals that I think we have in this course. That's actually a, a wonderful lead-in to uh, what I wanted to talk about um, in terms of the importance of ground truthing uh, in a in a age of digital uh, knowledge. Uh, Mark and I are both old enough to remember when research meant going to the library. You couldn't just sit at your computer and and uh, research whatever it is you wanted to know. Um, but these days, that's that's the way that we do it. And as you take advantage of the digital technology that allows you to search far and wide for any relevant information about discovering more about the place that you live, I want to suggest that it's absolutely imperative that you complement that process with getting outside, walking around, ground truthing your understanding of the place that you live. Uh, another thing that occurs to me is that often we're looking for authoritative sources uh, through the, the computer that are going to influence our knowledge and uh, in doing so we sometimes forget that there are elders living in our communities who remember what life was like there 60 years ago, 70 years ago, who have stories from their parents and grandparents and that's a part of the kind of knowledge that we're looking for too. It should not be merely academic knowledge. We're specifically looking for a, um, a bundle of understandings that combine what we can learn online from this miraculous technology to what we can learn from being on the ground, getting outside and walking around. If you're not doing that, if you go through this entire graduate program uh, sitting at your computer, not going outside and ground truthing things, then we've failed, I think, as, as instructors. I'll hop in. I do like that as practical advice. Um, I spent time in my life, you know, realizing that I didn't know where I lived, I didn't know the plants, I didn't know the watersheds, uh, and finding it important to try to rediscover this kind of information. And I've taught myself a decent bit living in places with books, Audubon guides, Peterson guides, going for walks in the woods, but I've never learned as much at all is when I went on a walk with someone who really knows their plants, really knows um, local natural information. I'm um, thinking of an old friend in Georgia and so um, the people in this course may be those folks but maybe you don't know your mushrooms or your birds. Uh, try to get someone who really knows their stuff and go on a good two-hour walk with them. Um, it's a great way to learn natural information and the other aspect of bioregionalism, which is the human communities we rediscover when we learn these things. Hmm. That seems like a perfect place to end this, uh, this first lecture. So that's about all we have for you today. We will be back uh, for the next lecture to continue to supplement the readings and the lectures that you're doing for class. So thanks so much.